La Zamora, Cincinnati. So we are here off of Sarsamora and Cincinnati Street in San Antonio, Texas, right near Woodlawn Lake, um, with Rambo Salinas. Um, we are here doing an interview for the West Side Sound Oral History Project in conjunction with UTSA, Dr. Silvia Mendoza, Dr. Gloria Gonzalez, Jaime Macias, owner of Jaime's Place, and myself, Jeremy Landin. Um, I will be interviewing Rambo today. Um, Rambo, are you fine with us using this video for the uh, West Side Sound Oral History Project? Sure, that's fine. So first we'll, we'll start off with the introduction. Tell us who you are, um, where you're from. Uh, my name is Rambo Salinas. Um, I'm from Alice, Texas, born and raised. Uh, southern border town, Texas. Uh, I've lived up in the Midwest for about 15 years and recently moved back here. It's been almost about 10 years to San Antonio. Living on Cincimora, which I call it, Zazamora, Cincinnati Ave, corner, blocked by sombras. <laughs> um, you, you work here in the neighborhood? Do you live here in the neighborhood? Uh, I don't. I don't uh, work too far. I'm a 10 minute bike ride because I bike everywhere. Uh, I manage Friends of Sound Records, which is a record store here. I've been managing the shop for almost six years now mm -hmm. and probably collecting and archiving music for 15, 15 to 20 maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, you're also a DJ, is that correct? Yeah, I tend, every once in a while, I tend to do some events or curate events. Um, bringing bands or DJs, I'll DJ sometimes as well. Um, I've started, you know, I started off as a hip hop kid, uh, lots of hip hop in my early years, and slowly progressed when I got closer to cities with more music than mm -hmm. Alice. Alice didn't have too much besides, uh, you know, the rich conjunto and the Hano history there. Um, I was able to kind of get more involved in all yeah. the different genres of music once, once I moved up north. So I've been collecting and doing that for quite a long time, most of my life. Sure, you um, mentioned you know your, your upbringing. You have um, siblings or, or? I have one brother who's uh, been in the Midwest now, two nephews, two half-brothers. Um, my mom is still in Alice and so is my, my dad. They're both in Alice, Texas. Yeah. Any of them musically inclined or? or? Uh, my dad, my dad I would say was where I got more most of the mm -hmm. history. My mom was very much into like pop music, but she also loved like uh, Linda Ronstadt. But it wasn't like deeper, you know, mm -hmm. like Conjunto Tejano stuff. My dad uh, originally he's from Palito Blanco, which people call Ben Bolt now. Um, lived on a, a ranch with his family, and that's those are probably my fondest memories of of music as far as you know running through the through the trucks and the cars as kids you know when they're parked mm -hmm. on the grass and playing hide and seek and then in the back would always be like Conjunto or Tejano and the smell of mollejas or something yeah. you know grilling out so. so you think your your childhood kind of had an impact on the music you listen to major impact for sure those early years were uh you know it was something that i didn't really recognize you know because it was so you know when things are in front of you that are constant, you start to take them for granted. And you know, mm -hmm. growing up in Alice, you live there your whole life, and that is around you all the time. That's what most of the music is. Uh, when I stepped away, was when I started like kind of coming back deeper into it. You mm -hmm. know, I always had it, but it was then I really started to respect and realize. You know, once I traveled around the U.S. more, mm -hmm. realized how important and how you couldn't find this anywhere else. Yeah. You couldn't find it the same way. You could find it, but you weren't gonna find it. Mm, you know that rich. Uh, where have you traveled to? You you've been all around. Uh, everywhere. I've, I've uh, you know I was in Minneapolis for a while. That's where I started my first uh, you know kind of record DJ night called Hot Pants, which was a rare funk soul night, mainly forty mm fives, -hmm. with a uh, you know collab with four other uh, DJ collectors. And then I was in Chicago. Jump into Chicago a lot. Mm -hmm. You know San Francisco, L.A., uh, Oakland and New York because my, my best friends out there so I was jumping around there yeah. as well and kind of in Detroit kind of just you know when I got into records and was fully mm -hmm. gonna go all in um, that's when I really just started traveling mm -hmm. and finding the circles of you know we, we kind of like finding your people you know mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very niche to be into 
like very specific or rare, hard to find, like funk soul records mm -hmm. back then for me. So even in Minneapolis, I still had to go to Chicago a lot uh, and to Detroit and those places and Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, just had amazing scenes and that was definitely the first steps into getting into those circles of other people who were collectors and could help me find things that, that I was looking forward to add to my collection. So, so music's taken you lots of places. Yeah, it, it definitely has. I've been blessed to, to, you know, when I think of where I'm from and where I, what I've been able to witness thus far in my life, I, I feel very blessed. Mm -hmm. I've, I've hung around some amazing artists and musicians and witnessed some things that, you know, yeah. I'm just, I feel lucky because I know yeah. that sometimes some of these things I witness, there's not a lot of people there to, to witness them. So yeah. it's kind of yeah. amazing. Um, who are some of those artists that you've, you've hung around with or... or been able to interact with <laughs> there's so many um, oh man oof and just so you know we're, we're kind of asking some of those general questions it, go, it and then goes it goes kind of so. wow I have to like think so far back because there's just so many I mean I remember hanging out with Tony Allen which is the drummer for Fela Kuti. Uh that was amazing that was, that was a good time you know uh, Nick Barrial, you know, the, the last, got to play for him the last two shows before he he passed away. Uh, Flaco, um, in the back parking lots of Salute, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just these uh, amazing people you get to, I mean, Little Henry, uh, Sonny Ace, Sonny Ozuna, um, geez, Joe Jama, good friends mm -hmm. with, like, these are people that I, there were, they were my stars, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When when I was living in Minnesota and everyone was collecting, um, you know, Funk Soul from Detroit, Chicago, mm -hmm. I really wanted to collect stuff from, from here, like deeper into my roots. And uh, to be able to, to when, it, when I was able to move back here and uh, meet a lot of these people that were kind of my stars. Mm -hmm. And that's just one, like, plethora of, of those artists. There's also, like, other music I'm into mm -hmm. and been able to you know, meet and talk with some of these people or collab with some of these people. But there's a lot. I'd have to, like, write them down. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm hard when it, when you hear me questions like that. I'm just yeah. Like, oh, like, no, no. So many. I'm well, like, you know, we're, we're talking about West Side Sound, and I first wanted to get, like, a little bit of, of your background, some of the, you know, experiences that have kind of led you to, to where you are now. Um, but really want to get into West Side Sound, right? So to you, what is, can you describe for us what West Side Sound is? Um, well, you know, there's there's probably so many answers for that, you know, because I'm sure everybody, especially uh, different generations, um, depending on when you were born and raised, if you were there when the music was happening, um, you know, to someone like me who was not there, but, you know, obviously I'm very in tune with a lot of the music that was made during that time. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it's a, a combination, like, when people... For me, when people say the West Side Sound, I feel like it's a combination of, of, you know, Mexican roots here in San Antonio, mixed with old Highway 90 sound coming from New Orleans. So you had this 50s, you know, back then would be rock and roll. You know, mm -hmm. we're not talking Kiss, but we're talking like 50s, uh, Big J and like you know mm -hmm. saxophones and stuff like that, which would be like an R&B, 50s R&B rock and roll. Um, that sound kind of trickling down to the mm -hmm. south of San Antonio and going back and forth and those young kids kind of picking that up like listening to their parents music but then yeah. picking up rock and roll picking up soul from the black musicians and then that kind of like all these stars aligned with those places around Texas and San Antonio and then once the military with the military added to it there was just so many people that were mixing together uh, musicians and artists so you had a lot of people that were, you know, creating this funky soul sound with the Spanish, you know, mm -hmm. Mexican flavor on it, yeah. you know, uh, Tex-Mex, you know. Uh, that's what I think a lot, when a lot of people say West Side Sound, they're usually uh, people that are talking about like 50s to, I would say like, you know, 70s, you know, which is the Jesters, Dimas, Sonny, mm -hmm. a, lot of the, a lot of those bands that were not all in this area because a lot of them, like Sonny's from Southside, you know, he's not mm -hmm. not a West Sider, but still I think the sound begun began to get its name because of the stuff that was going on on the mm -hmm. West Side. And a lot of the labels and stuff were, 
you know, there's, there's artists and labels that were on the streets that were mm -hmm. inside the Westside community. So when you were growing up in, in Alice, were you hearing Westside Sound over there, or was it not until later? It wasn't until later. I, you know, it was there, like, Sunny, uh, Ozuna, and the Sunliner, stuff like that, but my dad was either country or como torta. Like, mm -hmm. that was it. You weren't getting, you know, he, he was a truck driver, so I was always hearing music with him, mm -hmm. but, you know, there would be some rock, but you were never going to hear rap or, like, that much soul mm -hmm. stuff, you know, so... It wasn't until I got away and got deeper into records that I started to find out so much more about the that's that fifty sixty sound and yeah. the, you know the element of New Orleans and white garage rock mm -hmm. and all this other stuff coming together and these these kids in San Antonio just picking it all up and yeah. <laughs> kind of making it you know kind of copying yeah. it but making it their own. It's like like any other band you start with a few covers and you cut a few records with those covers until you kind of like get your groove and you can create your own songs and. That's what yeah. will come out later when a lot of these artists created their own material. Yeah. Do you, you have any early memories of when you first listened to West Side Sound? Uh, yeah, I do. I, you know, I was already into to older music, um, but I remember being in Chicago for an event, and um, there was a, a record that really drove me for, for years that I was looking for. It was a Steve Jordan's cover of, um, uh, it's a Motown cover. I'm trying to remember it now. I'll have to think about it. Um, but I was looking for it for years. It took a long time to find yeah. that record. And finally, somebody somebody uh, found one here in Texas, and I had to make a phone call. And, mm -hmm. you know, back and forth. Back then, it was before eBay and all these yeah. things. You, you sent a money order, and someone played you the record over the phone. Like, hey, is this the one you're looking for? Yeah. And I heard it, and um, it just it drove me bonkers because I was just looking for it. And it was a Motown cover with an accordion because it was, mm -hmm. you know, I bought you that Steve Jordan. And when I finally got it, that that record was just such a such a cross. Yeah. Of, I mean, when you talk about Tex-Mex and like Motown crossing each other yeah. and creating this song that, you know, still hits, but hits different for people from here because of mm -hmm. that accordion in the background. I think that was the, the one that like the wormhole just got bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's oh, funny, you kind of think awesome. of, that makes me think of when you see those, you know, those those little memes and stuff on Facebook where, you know, it's like you picked up a, a CD from the Pulga and it's, you know, <laughs> they got the, the little twist on it. Yeah. Um, so you kind of, you kind of, you kind of hit on it a little bit, but what are some of those key instruments that kind of make West Side Sound, West Side Sound? Man, uh, horns, big time on the horns. Um, Especially the early West Side Sound, which I, I think is more uh, R&B influenced, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, New Orleans. So you got like Sonny Ace and Frank Rodarte, and those cats that can, can have that big conky horn, uh, kind of like Junior Walker and the All-Stars. That sound, that sound and that tone mm -hmm. um, is early rock, you know, and that, that to me is a huge thing. The horns, uh, there's, there's certain riffs um, and songs, if you listen to enough of this music and, mm -hmm. and you dig through enough records... Um, bands names change but a lot of times the musicians don't yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. like it's this so, so you know I've gone through records and I'll be like that riff right there that's yeah. th that's this guitar over here I know it's the same guitar yeah. like things like that uh, you get excited about because you know how close uh, vicinity everyone is working together mm -hmm. you know? and listening to that is those guitar riffs that are on a few songs uh, a lot probably Robert Gomez uh, Joe Jama's bass lines, you know, a lot of Joe Jama mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and just those those drums, you know, yeah, a lot of a lot of amazing drummers, but Bones, you know, yeah. big up to Bones from the gestures like that. That drum, I mean, the way it's recorded and the way he's gotten it tightened is just, that's synonymous with West Side. You hear that pop and it's like, yeah, you can, you almost can feel like being, <laughs> being at the Palio Andalus where it's just like, oh yeah, it's, that's probably what it sounded like. Patio Andalus. So that's come up several times in these interviews. Some mm -hmm. of those places that you can hear this music. What are some of those places here in San Antonio that you either experience that are no longer here or the places you can go now to, to experience some West Side Sound? Um, wow, that has really changed, you know, from being here when I got here and obviously when I wasn't here um, to now where a lot of this music is, is being you know, it's more up to the forefront with a lot of reissues and numeral group and all these other people kind of giving this uh, music a new light. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, when I got here, a lot of the spots were like, uh, I can't remember what it was called. The, there was a ballroom over there by the mall. Mm -hmm. I think Henry, Henry, Henry Lee was part of that. They had bands there, uh, the Royal Palace. Mm -hmm. For sure, seen a lot of great shows at the Royal Palace yeah. Ballroom, uh, the Imperial Ballroom. Um, there was a spot over here called the. They used to be called the Keyhole Lounge on on Papa that, that, that mm -hmm. was. It's still there now. They have wrestling, but um, if you go in there, you can see the stage. Uh, now, like from then, like going to the older kind of events, mm -hmm. you know, the VFW downtown, Trader Village, you know, those places where you can still catch some of this stuff in the, in the smaller like mm -hmm. cantinas like cnl and some of these other spots where, where sometimes they'll pop up or yeah. frank will pop up at texas ice you know the right. ice houses um does it feel different from back then well i can't i can't really say because i wasn't there you know i'm getting my personal experience yeah. and and my feeling of of what i see it now as it mm -hmm. is and what i've seen in these years but I can't speak for what I missed. I you guess. Know? I guess. I mean, does does listening to music feel different than it did back when you first started getting introduced to it? Yes. When you uh, the time I've been able to spend here and meet people and and you know you can listen to a record and um, you know there's a lot of people into this music now too, but there's a difference when you're when you place yourself there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like. A record is one thing, and it might be played different live, but still, when you place yourself amongst the people that are in those records that you that you love and you know you you honor and believe in, um, whether it sounds the same from that '60s record or maybe they're a little older and it's not as, as, mm -hmm. as tight or something, mm -hmm. it's still just another feeling. You know, yeah. you're taking in those. Well, for me, I'm taking in those moments is, is uh, you know remembering them, and and from the record, it's different because this is like a whole another like brain function yeah. to, and memory to hold all of that in and what I'm seeing and what I'm witnessing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is, is, it is different to witness it here than to just be playing it like yeah. somewhere else. Like there's a community here and all these, all these musicians know each other, they've backed up each other, whether, whether they're cool with each other or have yeah. no beefs like anyone else, like you get, to, you get to witness and see everything and like how like some of these people that, that I know People love their music, you know, but they're, you know, they're still San Antonio. Yeah. They're still here. They still live here. This is their community. You know what I mean? And getting to witness that is is beyond the, what the record can give you. you know? So, to you, you think the West Side Sound represents the city and the culture of San Antonio? Um, I th I I think that it's it's its own. It's definitely its own. There's a there's a lot of rare music out there, and and you know different people that were trying different things in different cities, different mm -hmm. towns, different areas. There's always like little niche things in, in parts of the world. But I think that that specific R&B, soul, Chicano sound of, uh, you know, San Anto is definitely its own. Like if you start from the beginning of those blues R&B records yeah. and work your all the way to the 70s, like you're all of those musicians, when you kind of put it all together, you can, it, there's similarities, but it definitely has its own San Antonio feel to it for sure. Yeah. Um, you, we've kind of talked a little bit about about the music, where you listen to it. Um, you particularly, I think it's it's special to, to know where you find it. Um, we kind of had that conversation. Um, where, where do you find this music? When you, you know, we're, we're talking, you, you know, I'm, we're sitting here in your place of living, in your dwelling place, and you've got it all around. Um, what is? How did how did you get there? Um, you. It all starts with, you know. Really, um, listening, listening to something and know that you're in love with it. You know, mm -hmm. when you know, you're just like, what is this and why is it like, giving me all these yeah. feelings? You know, uh, once you find what you love, then you you never stop looking for it. So yeah. you just keep going, yeah. and uh, it's. It's hard not to because in Texas is very difficult, especially San Antonio and Central Texas, North Texas. Like, there's just so many records. There's yeah. like, it never ends. Like every time I think it's it's like I found something. There's something else. Yeah. And you know, it started with um, slowly, like the internet. You know, you you mm -hmm. you go on there, you start finding things, you start digging. A lot of 
the records that are hard to find, you'll still find like sound clips on YouTube or something. Mm -hmm. So you kind of go there, and then from there you have to dig further, and you you yeah. can dig so much further on the internet, like so far, I'm sorry, on the internet, but then there comes a wall. Mm -hmm. Like there comes a wall of just like, here's a record and it's something very important, like everyone else is after it, so everyone's gonna wanna pay for it. So you're battling that, you know, through yeah. auctions or yeah. whatever else. Uh, so if you're really, you know, hungry for it and like you really care about it, you'll start to just, you'll start to move around those walls, you know, yeah. you stop looking at the internet, you start looking at just, I'm only gonna dig out at stores and flea markets and then you start asking your cousins, you start you start being a detective, you know, like any record digger. You go to someone's house and you're like, Oh hey, you got records over there? Like, who's are those? Are those your uncles or what? Yeah. Let me talk to your uncle, where's he at? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Or whatever your tia like you just you start to, you know, keep an eye. And it's always there. It's like everywhere I go, I'm always just like, Yeah, what's over there? What's back there in that back room? Like you know, you just keep looking because you never know where, where it's going to pop out. You yeah. know what I mean? And just from there, you find other avenues. It just doesn't have, it doesn't have to be just the internet, you know? There's just asking your family and asking for friends and checking every little small store or whatever, you know, bodega. Why, why do you think, you know, I, I, I think I kind of sorbed off a little bit, but why do you think there, that so many fan, people are still fans of this music after so long? Or do you think that there are not fans of this music anymore as much as there used to be oh man that's you know with the music i mean the fans when it comes to talk about like uh like actual music and sound like the sound of the music mm -hmm. like it's you know the proofs in the pudding all that stuff is just really well done you know yeah. what i mean like those musicians are talented the uh, the shoddy engineering or however they recorded it just sounds just so powerful like all those records are thick wax and you put the needle down even if it looks scuffed like a lot of San Antonio records they'll still play on that deep groove and it's just that that deep sound of the way everything was recorded here and probably just a bunch of young kids not having access to all the you know latest equipment you know that people had in other areas um, that sound alone you know I feel like you you can it's easy to fall in love with it's easy yeah. it's it's not hard <laughs> hard yeah. to listen to good music so that's that's one thing i just don't think it's hard to not like um what was the other part of the question um the other part of the question was or or do you think that there are not many fans of this music anymore i think that there there are plenty of fans i don't think it's going anywhere it's growing now that we have access to more to to be able to like the internet the internet changed everything like obviously everywhere but these things were things that were just sitting you know amongst collectors or you know down down south here in san antonio mm -hmm. or in texas a lot of these records didn't make it that far up so you know now that we have access to the internet there's all these people there's these blueprints you know there's books out you know ruben has put out two books mm -hmm. one of chicago so like there's at least some kind of guide to guide you to find these things yeah. like all that stuff didn't exist before. Now, it, like that's within the last like 20, 10, maybe like 10, 15 years. So like, yeah. that has changed everything. I think that there's way more people that love this music now because there's just more access to it. Yeah. And there wasn't that access wasn't there for a very long time. So I don't think that, you know, I do think that it um, it changes kind of. Uh, Oh, describe it. I feel like it's very synonymous with low writing as well, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's just Chicano soul music, and you know, you got LA, you got Texas, and all these other areas. Um, but I think that it also, like, that is a huge key factor, and like, another big reason why this music stays alive is because a lot of it is very, like, it's it's a part of our low rider culture as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. it's they're tied, they're intertwined with each other. So that that kind of obviously we know like that kind of culture never is never gonna die mm -hmm. and, and so the music does not die either <laughs> like, yeah. that'll go on forever like it's yeah. never ending <laughs> yeah. like and that's I, that's why i bring it up because that's a very different response like i've gotten from different people there's some that say it's gone already and i'm like no, you know no and way. that's and that's and that's that's why it's good to see that you know there's so many different and what's interesting and we were kind of talking about this the other day is now there's younger people who are kind of 
taking this music and using it in different ways. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Or... Uh, I mean, I could. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, um, you know, you know, following what you were talking about with just, um, you know, some people saying like, oh, it's, it's, it's no longer around or it's dead. Um, you know, the, the, the proof is in the stats, you know. You look yeah. at the numbers and you look at things and you, you look at, you know, where, where were the Royal Jesters, you know, 20 years ago to where are the Royal Jesters now? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you got Dimas' song in the back of the Black Messiah. Like, you know what I mean? You have it in ma major motion pictures, you know. Yeah. You got people that are, you know, trying to buy these licensing uh, for a lot of these songs because they want to put them in movies because no one's been able to use them because they've kind of been under, like, in a treasure chest for a little while, you know. Since those records didn't, weren't able to make it so far out, they've been here. So now that there's a public access to so much of it, I think that it, you know, like when I say the numbers, like you, you know, I've been, it's been what, like 15 years and 10 years. I look at a record that I bought 10 years ago to look at it now. And it's like, yeah. there wasn't anybody fighting for that record 10 years ago. Now that $50 record is like a $200 record. And wow. it's just like, damn, like that's how fast that can happen. So I don't think that the demand ever really stops for it. I just think, I still think we have, there's still a lot that hasn't even been recognized yet. There's still yeah. a lot of work to be done. Like there's a lot of these musicians who, who still have not got their due yet. Like, and they deserve it because, you know, people have been playing their music in another country and filling rooms of people dancing to it. And sometimes they have no clue that's even happening because mm -hmm. it's across the ocean and when you think of that, you realize that like there's just there's it's not just us. There's all these other people that that want to enjoy it too, yeah. you know. Yeah. So there's a, definitely always a balance of of being able to help, like give that and mm -hmm. help let people enjoy it, but at the same time trying to like like guard it and, and yeah. keep it keep it safe. You know what I mean? Because like when so much of it goes out, it's hard to like keep it safe from other people who want to come out here and like kind of just take records or you know and take a, it, it, I feel like everyone should enjoy them yeah but I also feel like there is there needs to be a balance when you start to take out so much of these you know artifacts yeah from certain neighborhoods and certain barrios like it's it's when you run out when the world when the well runs dry man that's that's it you know yeah it's hard to to find your culture or find those those relics yeah you know I call I, that's I Call them fossils and relics, because really that's what they are. They're yeah. stamping time, and you know they're not forever. People destroy them; they break. You know, once those are all gone, they're no more. You know. You do you consider the work you do music preservation? Um, man, that's a good question. I mean, there, you there, help there people is. find music, but you also you've also got a, a lofty collection, right? Like, um, what happens to your music when when you're you know, gone? Right? I I. I've never, I'm kind of humble about it, and I've honestly, like, never really, um, I've always just kind of done it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I never felt that, like, there was, like, a mentor or anyone kind of pushing me to do it. It was just something I wanted to do. Yeah. Like, I yeah. was like, this is, if somebody needs to do this, I want to do it. Um, this seems like me. I guess this is my fit. Um, as far as, like, preserving, like, I've i preserved a lot of stuff in my mind, you know, and written a lot of stuff down as far as like meeting people, talking about songs yeah. with some of these musicians. Uh, obviously the records I've made, I've made f like four compilations, super limited, but you know, I did two CDs over a span of like six years. Yeah. I've done, you know, we did the Chicano power tape, which was all uh, Spanish lowrider ballads from Chuco town, El Paso and from San Antonio. So I, I feel like I might not be on a level uh, to get the respect that some people get uh, for, you know, licensing or putting things out into the wide open. Yeah. But I still feel like it's part of a job to, for me to make those things, you know, yeah. and, and give them to the public. Yeah, we're going to take a quick pause just okay. so I can restart this. All right, we're starting this again. Um, no, I think I think that's perfect. I think, you know... Sometimes we don't we don't realize what what role we're playing until we've played it, right? Exactly. Um, one of the things that 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 interests me about about your journey, I personally, you know, a lot of people have 
have said, you need to interview Rambo, you need to interview Rambo, right? Um, but I met you at Janie's record shop. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to me a little bit about, about how, you know, the elders in the music industry have played on your, on, on your career? And, and, uh, and why that's important to preservation of things like West Side Sound, right? Um, it's, it's huge. Uh, you know, I know Janie, you know, just, just speaking of Janie, uh, I came down here probably like 15 years ago looking for a record and um, I stopped in Janie's, bought some things, left down to Alice to go see my family and she called me on my way back up north, uh, up to San Antonio to catch my flight out. She's like, I found that record for you. I was like, okay. I was like, I got like 20 minutes. I'm, I'm running in and out. Like, yep. I gotta get this plane. <laughs> and sure, you know, sure enough, she found it for me. It was Latin Breed. I needed a Si Yo Pudiera on the USA album and uh, this was years ago uh, to me that was hard to find years ago yeah. you know I, I couldn't find it in, in yeah. the Midwest and you know but that was such a beautiful relationship to to build with Janie and you know eventually I would move down here and like you know telling them that those were my plans back then yeah and um, following through and like moving down here and then constantly being someone that would like I remember showing up oh, god I was silly but I would bike with my caliphone this huge <laughs> record player right here and with that and a backpack full of records to Janie's just so I could play her like oldies like because yeah. they they didn't have a, a like a, a loud record player back then and they didn't have a lot of the records that I had because they were so hard to find so I was like hey I'm gonna come out and just play you records so yeah. I did that I just would go to the shop and just sit there and like DJ on, yeah. like, on, a, on one record player just for her and you know, sit there with her, and, you know, just so much information, you know, the elders that we have around uh, that are still with us, and having those opportunities to be able to, like, sit down and talk with them, or just be able to study them, you know, like yeah. how she would work, and how she had her books, and how she would, you know, she would hear something on the radio, and immediately start looking for, like, a catalog number, like, she really had her, her faculties together, you know, she knew, she knew what was everything. Yeah. And it was so surprising because I was so much into this West Side Sound, but like my conjunto, my Tejano were like trash. I was just not, <laughs> like I didn't have all, all this knowledge yet. So it was great to pick up from, you know, people like her, you know, Rich, uh, Herrera, like getting to be able to hang out with some of these, these uh, elders and soak up information like that kind of stuff. Like we don't have... We don't have a museum yet. We don't have this, like, we have these things, but we don't have nothing in San Antonio that is, like, that is documenting these stories from yeah. these folks that we're not, you know, if you don't get them and put them and lock them inside your head, you're not going to be able to get them later. And yeah. a lot, it's not always just the musicians. It's the people that were witnessing those things in the 60s and 70s or even before. Yeah. Like, being able to get those stories straight from, you know, from them is so crucial. Like, that's, like... Yep. that's the price of stuff that's the that's the real goal beyond the records like that's the goal to have those kinds of stories you know and i've, I've i have quite a few and it's it's been an honor to, to be able to carry them because um we have to we have to continue to carry those stories yeah. like somebody has to do it but yes it's it's major and one of the main reasons why i moved back here was because i knew i could not just be this DJ playing these records mm -hmm. and not be like fully immersed like it, there was no like you know sitting on the fence for me when it came to that it was like all right well you're gonna have to find a place to live because you need to be there and that's what I did yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just like all right that's gonna happen then yeah <laughs> and you know without moving here I wouldn't I would never have the stories I have right now or the the music, the records, the relationships that I have with some of these musicians, that would you have to be here. Yeah. It's it's hard to to really um, talk with as much depth or, or uh, honesty unless you're really like in it and see yeah. what everyone else is going through together as a community, you know what I mean? It's it's hard if you're from far away, you gotta yeah. really be put your you know, put your hands in the soil like they say. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, I mean, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, gone through some of your, you know, your personal life, um, your profession as a, as a DJ, you know, managing the shop, um, you know, and, and, and a lot about West Side Sound. Are, are, there, are there specific things that, 
that you want to share that you want to make sure gets out there um, something um, that we we save in these videos uh you know I just I what would it look like 20 years from now yeah <laughs> um, you know just to be wise uh, about the just to be wise about the cost of your culture you know what I mean like does your culture really have a price tag um, when it comes to these things that we're talking about you know when I speak of like fossils and relics and stuff like that like these things you know we're looking at them now and, and, and kind of it's catching itself making its second turn around you know around the world yeah. like to where 60s all right it kind of like died off you know and people forgot and here it comes again with all these youthful people that are interested in, in this music again um, just the, you know the price and, and being mindful of what our like what our culture is worth because it's very there is nothing else like it you know it's called West Side Sound for a reason mm -hmm. because it made its own name and that means that there's nothing else like it really so we need to be wise about what we do with these things and the stories and you know how how we present them to other cultures and also how we uh, keep them you know safe in our own culture and making sure that we that those things are still around and that yeah. we can still have those spaces that, that they're happening or we can still have the stories or those records like kids are kids 20 years from now still need to be able to hold on to a record and look at it with their own eyes to yeah. understand like the actual tangibility of it um, mm -hmm. you know if they're all gone you can't do that yeah. so we have to be wise about how we move them around what's left what we're seeing now like we find these collections we see things like where are they going where yeah. you know who's keeping them are we keeping enough here in the city to make sure that there's at least a viable source for for the youth when they need it like stuff like that i think is is something we need to keep an eye on because i feel there will be more and more mining of the music and a lot more of it will start to disappear yeah. as far as like not the music in general because it's always going to be there electronically mm -hmm. but having actual physical copies of, of things are going to yeah. be hard to very they're going to be very hard to find they're going to be very expensive yeah. and that's going to be hard for a community that is a city that is you know doesn't have the economic status as california or yeah. new york where people are getting paid tons of money and can afford two hundred dollars on a record with no problem uh, you know you're talking about community that is under that bracket and yeah. it, it makes it a lot harder for them to hold on to their own stuff like this yeah. is our stuff but what happens when you can't even afford your own culture anymore mm -hmm. like that's dangerous game to play so yeah you still need to be wise about how we put things out there and and who gets access to those things first i think is is very important too you know when something breaks you know the community should come together to make sure that everybody knows about that yeah. before it grows into the next the next pod out of the world and everyone starts yeah you know it's like feed the feed the village first and then, yeah. and then yeah. let everyone else eat you know yeah. gotta take care of yours so uh, i think that's going to be a huge thing in the future is is making sure that we take care of it and uh how we present it around to everyone else around the world yeah well i know we're, we're almost done i, I was just going to share because you said this um when my grandpa passed, uh, he had about two, 200 vinyls left, um, and he knew I loved music, but when at that point, I don't think I had realized yet the value of, 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 of well, vinyl records, right, or even of the music in general, and I took them, I was living at St. Mary's right here down the street, and, um, and I didn't, I said, I don't know any of these people. And I took them, and, and like many people do now without thinking about it, um, that don't know what those things, you know, what, what they're really worth, the tangibility of them, like how important they are, I, I put them on my wall. I, I took <laughs> the, 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 no, 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 I took the black record LP out and, them out. and put thumb, thumb, thumbtacks in the middle hole. And hung them on the wall. So I had a wall of records. Everyone would walk in. Thought, oh, I thought cool. it was the coolest looking thing. It wasn't until later that I realized. Oh, wait a second. 
this is good music. I was taking it down, moving from one place to another. Like, oh, and I started shit, putting them on there, and I had La Hermanas Huerta, Lucha oh, Villa. Man. I had the, the three combo sets from Vicente Fernandez. I had... Um, like, these don't belong in the water. I had more. Henry Valderrama. Um, I still have a couple Henry Valderrama ones. And, and I, when I saw Rick Valderrama, I told him that story. Um, I've got some Sunny Osuna. I don't know what any of it's worth, really. Like, in... in, in but if still, I were to sit, it's, come it's forward. a memory for you. But, like, you know, I kept them because it was it was my grandpa's, but I didn't have that knowledge to know, you know, what they were worth. And that's kind of what you just hit on is, you know, even if we have it in front of us, you know, a lot of our our elders, the 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 um, the baby boomers are starting to starting to pass, right? And they're leaving things to people, and you're seeing these estate sales. And you just see, you know, someone walk in and, oh, yeah, take the whole stack for 20 bucks or 30 bucks. And it's oh, like, yeah, there's sure. good stuff in there that someone's going to take off and, like you said, throw it on eBay, not knowing what it's worth, and just see it sell for two or three hundred bucks a piece. Um, and, the, and the worst is, even harder, is when people know that people pass and, like, there's already vultures, like, waiting. And I've seen it. Yeah. Like, they're like... Oh, are you getting rid of anything? Like what? You know what I mean? Like yeah. anytime somebody in the community passes, especially musician, like do you have any records left? Like, dude, people, people from across the world make phone calls. Like, hey, is there anything left? Like, dude, it's it's gotcha well, sometimes, well, dude, for real. Yeah. Like, like chill, man. Let this dude like let his family chill out first. Like, yeah. it, it, you know, there, it's hard when this music kind of has like a. a Especially being down here, being in this yeah. in this area, has its own like I don't even know this is a word, but hum hum, humbleability, like like this humbleness to it, you know uh -huh. what I mean? And when you have other people that want it for other reasons, that's like having these humble people and in, in, in like with a sea in a sea of sharks. Yeah. Because these sharks already know they're they're not afraid to run over people. And when you're somebody who's just like, oh, like, this is just what I love. And, like, this is this is from my heart, my corazón. This is my heart's music. You know what I mean? Those people, a lot of times those people, when I say, like, starting to watch out, it's like, those people, they don't care yeah. where it came from. Or, or if it's involved with their family. Like, they just want those records because they want them for other reasons. Whether yeah. it's just to DJ them somewhere or they want to resell them or, like, make money off them. Like, there's so many other reasons. So definitely you know have to keep on to those things it's hard for our own folks sometimes to to fight somebody they're not used to fighting you yeah. know what i mean somebody comes in with like all oh, this money or this and they've they've been all over the place you know some people don't get to leave san antonio man yeah. and like they don't know how that how that works how those sharks are out there because they're there yeah so when these guys when these folks come out sometimes they like shit somebody dies they're yeah. already there like hey so you've seen that Oh, I've seen it happen with other collectors for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen it happen at a person's funeral. Oh, wow. Yeah, like super disrespectful, and I was just like, I can't believe you guys. Like, But that that's how some people play. Yeah. And you need to, you know, if you're not ready, if you haven't moved around enough to see that, you get took sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes that happens a lot, you know? Yep. Wow. Well, I think that's, that's basically... That's basically it, unless you want to share anything else. Um, I think that's good, man. That's a good...